Okay, linear graphs and system structural properties. Um, so, definition. A system graph is an oriented linear graph of a system. So, what we're going back to do now is we have this idea of a state-determined system that we just learned about. The state equation, bread, x dot or dx dt equals ax plus bu. And we've got our output equation, our butter, y equals cx plus du. And now we want to learn how to take a linear graph and create a state model. Okay, so that's that's the larger picture of what we're doing. Now let's descend into the linear graph and how to come up with structural properties and how we will end up uh, generating these state equations is going to come out of this. So, all right, that's why we're doing it. So, a system graph is an oriented linear graph. A connected graph is a system graph in which there exists a path via branches and nodes between all pairs of nodes. So this is a connected graph because you can go from any node to any other node in this graph, right? This, if you were to consider these to be one graph, this is a disconnected graph because there's no way to go from this node here to this node here, right? Can't do it. Disconnected. All right. So that's a little definition. Once again, this is graph theory. So we're just, you know, doing some more graph theory. No big deal. Doing a little linear algebra, a little vector calculus, a little graph theory. Just doesn't bother us at all. We're good. So this system normal tree is a device that we're going to use. So this is once again a graph theory thing. We're going to use it to help us construct our state equations. Okay, um, that's it, this is the first step that we'll take when we've got a linear graph and we want to construct the state equations from it. So graph trees are subgraphs of the system graph. We will use a special type of graph tree called a normal tree to identify one, the system primary and secondary variables. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about that. The system order n, the state variables, and a set of independent compatibility and continuity equations. Okay, that is what we're going to use the normal tree to do. So in the following, we will consider a connected system graph with B branches of which S are sources, okay? There are two B minus S unknown across and through variables. How did I come up with that number? A two B minus S unknown across and through variables. So each branch has associated with it and a cross variable and a through variable, right? So it could be voltage and current, it could be force and velocity. Each branch has an unknown um, uh, across and through variable. So, well, the source ones we know, right? We know what the source specified variable is. So if it's an across variable source, we know the across variable. We don't know the through variable, we know the across variable. For a through variable source, we know the through variable, not the across variable. So 2b minus s is two variables crossing through per branch minus the source because we know the source specified variable. All right. Okay, so there are 2b minus s unknown across and through variables. So we need this many equations, right? We need 2b minus s equations to solve, right? Because because algebra. All right. b minus s elemental equations are used. OK, so we're, we're going to write an elemental equation for each what we call passive branch, a branch that's not a source. 
We can write an elemental equation for it, right? So if it's a resistor, that's somebody's law. Ohm's law. Uh, if it's a if it's a uh, a mass, whose law is it? Newton. Which of his laws? Second law. Yeah. So that so we have an elemental equation for each branch. That's not a source. Okay. So that's good. N is the number of nodes in the system graph. So the following rules we're going to go through next time must be respected when selecting branches for the normal tree. So we're going we're to get into a little bit more depth next time. Um, I'll also do some linear algebra next time because I feel like it might be time for that. Okay. Have a good day. And I'll see you in lab tomorrow for lots of good, good fun. Wheatstone bridges, right? bridges and more. Haircut. I like it. Yeah. It's cool. So, <laughs> stop chasing your dreams. <laughs> I mean, she used it already. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so let's. We got the rest of the, the last set of notes that we were working on, and we're going to do a crash course in linear algebra. So we were in the middle of, which, 36? Yeah, yeah. We're, uh, what did you think I know, right? Oh, yeah, we didn't start 36. Oh, we didn't start 36? I don't know, wait. We did. We got up to, we did like the first little yeah. connected, disconnected, and then stopped. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't get the rest of the normal tree. All right. So. We were uh, in, under the broad topic of linear graphs and system structural properties, and we are now getting into normal trees, which I promised we're going to have something to do with constructing the state space model from the linear graph. It's going to be like the first step is to construct a normal tree. It's really, um, it's like a guide to help us through writing the equations that we need. Um, all right, so in order to construct a normal tree, um, it's, uh, and rem remember, a normal tree is a subgraph of your linear graph. So you draw a linear graph of your system, and then you need to take, select a subgraph of that, which is going to be your normal tree. Now, um, we're going to use that, like I said last time, uh, to identify the system's primary and secondary variables, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, the system order, n, the state variables, and a set of independent compatibility and continuity equations. So those are the those are some of the key things we need, and this normal tree is going to help us with that. So um, we have uh, defined n to be the number of nodes in the system graph, b to be the number of branches, s to be the number of sources. And we have the following rules that must be respected for a normal tree when selecting branches for the tree. So pretty much what we have to do is we have to select some branches from the linear graph we've constructed to be part of the normal tree. So each branch either is or is not part of the normal tree. Okay? So we have to decide which ones are. Uh, the following rules must be respected for a normal tree when selecting branches. Rule one, you can't create a loop. Okay, so your normal tree can't have a loop in it. 
And rule two, you gotta select n minus one branches. Okay, so n is the number of nodes in the system graph. Uh, there's an equivalent version of rule two, which pretty much says you have to go until you can't select any more without creating a loop. Okay, that's the one that's easier to kind of remember. Um, you know you're done when you can't select any more branches without creating a loop. Okay. So the following steps can be used to, to form a normal tree. Step one, and on the right column here, I'm going to do uh, an example graph. You guys have that, right? Uh, let me just get to my notes here. All right. So the first step is to draw the system graph nodes. So we've got the system graph. So the way that I do this is I take the original graph, I start with it, and then I, I start just changing the color. Now you guys on paper can't necessarily do that, but you can use, one common thing to do is use a highlighter, okay? Uh, or use another color pen or something like that, and then just draw a line beside the, the line that you want to include in your normal tree. Um, you can redraw a normal tree beside your linear graph, that's totally fine. Whichever is easiest for you. Um, it's, I find it to be easiest to just use the original graph and, and change colors of the, the branches that you, you are including in your normal tree. So, the, the, all of the nodes are going to be in the normal tree, okay? Every node. Um, then, select all across variable sources, okay? So the highest priority, so what we're doing is we're going down this list of priorities for including a branch into the normal tree. And R1 and R2 are two rules that we can't violate as we do that. Okay? So select all of the across variable sources. In this linear graph that I am using as our example, we have selected the one and only across variable source. It is a this appears to be an electronic system, right? Because it's got resistors, capacitor, and inductor in it. So, so it's an electric system. So this is a voltage source. So it's an across variable source. So you've got to select it. If it was a current source, would I select it? No. If it was a force source, would I select it? No. No. If it was a velocity source, would I select it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. So we selected it. And the next thing we do, step three, select as many as possible A-type elements. What I mean by as many as possible is you can't violate the rules R1 and R2. So if you select an A-type element and you violate a rule, you have to go back and deselect that. Okay. So, as many as possible A-type elements. So for an electronic system, those are capacitors, right? So we got to select as many as possible. We select the capacitor, and there's only one. So that's all we can do. Um, did it create a loop? And are there... Uh, uh, so it didn't create a loop, so we know it was a valid, it was a valid thing to do. Um, and we ran out of... A type elements without without uh, exhausting our ability to select more because we could select this one or this one and not create a loop, right? If we selected them both, we'd create a loop. If we select R one, do we create a loop? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Oh. we do, right? Because this would be a loop. Oh, does it have to be like a, like like the if the voltage source was like pointing up? Oh, the direction doesn't matter. Oh. Direction of the arrow doesn't matter as far as creating loops go goes. <laughs> All right, cool. So, step four: select as many as possible D-type elements. So, A-type, we're done. D-type, what are D-type? 
for resistors for an electronic system. So we can we can't select R1, right? I already said that. If we select R1, we create a loop. Can't create that loop. So we select R2, didn't create a loop. And the last step is to select as many as possible T-type elements. Now, there is a T-type element here, the inductor, but we can't select it, can we? That would create a loop. So, we're done. We actually knew we were done because at this point, we can't select any more elements in the graph without creating a loop. So, yes? Is there a reason behind the uh, order of elements being selected? The A, then D, then T? Yeah, so, yes. Um, <clears throat> the reason is that we're going to construct rules for what to do with the normal tree based on how we constructed it. So, if we use this, then we'll be able to apply rules later that will give us a minimal set of equations that can be solved. Okay. So we don't have to get a bunch of redundant equations like we were prone to previously when we were just writing them down. Like we could write continuity equations more than we needed. We could write uh, uh, compatibility equations more than we needed. And we, we wandered our way through that. Choosing this route for constructing a normal tree is going to allow us to later on apply a strict set of rules to get a minimal set of equations to solve. Okay, and that would be messed up if you did, say, D type or A type? Exactly. Exactly. If you did it that way, then your, your normal tree would not, would not yield the, the minimal set of equations that you want. So we'll, we're going to talk about how we use the normal tree soon, and it'll become a little bit more apparent why we constructed it that way. Um, uh, it's it's uh, it's just sort of a it's a mnemonic of sorts. Like we we're using it as a tool for learning which equations we want to write. All right. So it's actually really so when we construct the normal tree, we will often do so in about five seconds because we can run through this list of rules in our head pretty quickly and just you know highlight 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 and then we're done and it's usually pretty straightforward um, so we call elements in the normal tree branches and elements of the system graph not in the normal tree links okay so branches of the normal tree tree, branches, right? And then we can link those branches. Uh, there's another term for that. People call it a uh, twig. Some people <laughs> call that a twig. I haven't ever used that terminology. I'm not a huge fan of it because it's a little cutesy, but it, it works. Okay. Chase your dreams, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's not bad. <laughs> um, all right, so A type elements not in the normal tree. Okay, so remember A types are the ones we selected first, right? So A types that don't end up in the normal tree and T type elements that are in the normal tree are called dependent energy storage elements, okay? So you might remember that I said a little while ago that the system order, which we called little n in the past, the system order, which is equal to the number of state variables, right, is, the, is equal to the number of independent energy storage elements. And I promised that we would be able to discover which energy storage elements are dependent and which are independent. And the, and the normal tree, one of the things we get for sort of for free along the way with the normal tree is that we get to determine which of those energy storage elements are dependent and which ones are independent. Okay? So that's, that's a helpful thing. Um, all other A and T type 
elements are independent energy storage elements. The energy in these can be independently controlled. The idea here, sort of physically, is that if you have dependent energy storage elements, you can't independently fill that element with energy without affecting another energy storage element. So they, they're, they're linked together and you can't, you can't uh, uh, control them independently. So an example of this um, is actually two capacitors in parallel with each other, okay? Because they share a common voltage when they do, and therefore you can't specify the energy in one uh, independently of the energy in the other. So they're dependent energy storage elements. Okay. And what's nice is when we construct our normal tree, we would discover that, oh, these two are not... So uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and do that. So if I had another capacitor here, say, just for fun, I drew in a capacitor here as well. Um, select as many as possible A-type elements. I would only be able to select one or the other, right? Because if I selected them both, they would create a loop. And that would mean that one of those capacitors would not be in the normal tree, right? And that means that an A-type element not in the normal tree is a dependent energy storage element. So that means that the energy in that parallel capacitor would be dependent on the other capacitor. All right? So that's a little further explanation, I guess. Whenever A-type elements are connected in series or T-type elements are connected in parallel, we should combine them using so the two equations are the generalized capacitance, the equivalent generalized capacitance, is equal to 1 divided by the sum of all of the uh, of all of the uh, uh, generalized capacitances, the inverse of generalized capacitances. So, for instance, if we have two capacitors um, that are connected in series like this, um, then we would be able to combine their capacitances like this. And if you had inductors that are parallel to each other, or generalized inductances, so spring constants as well, then we would be able to combine them with the same sort of expression, add them all up in this way. So this would give us you would be able to write a single capacitance C equivalent, and you'd be able to write a single inductance, whoa, well, I just missed, L equivalent. Make sense? Yeah. You can do that when you're doing your normal tree. So like in the other example, you had the two uh, capacitors in parallel. Because you just equate that to one equivalent and put that in the normal tree. So if there are two capacitors in parallel, we wouldn't be able to do this because it's only for capacitors in series that we can so you can't build an equation, do this. So. Right. So it only works for a capacitor in series and an inductor in parallel. And, and we do this, whenever we see this, this happens, we need to just be careful to watch out for this. Like if, you, if you have, this occurs when you have, for instance, two springs side by side, okay? They're 
that are in parallel to each other, then you need to combine their, their spring constants in this way and come up with an equivalent spring constant. Uh, if you have two capacitors in series, you need to combine them and make a, a single capacitance out of it. Um, it prevents excess state variables and system order from happening. So it's, you can get fooled by your results if you don't do this. So this is something that whenever we see this happen, we got to make sure we do that. So when we look at our linear graph, before we start constructing the normal tree and doing things with it, we have to combine these. As, as shown. It's easy to do, we just have to recognize we need to do it. Okay, so that is that is the end of this, of this uh, set of notes, and I, I want to transition.